Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. I'm going to get this going just because we're on a 40, well, 35 minute timer now um, with this, oh, yeah. this set. True. So um, I will get going pretty quickly because, you know, after 35 minutes, we're we're going to be vanishing. No. Are you going to throw that in the stinger? Excuse again? me. Let me go get some tomatoes <laughs> and come back. Uh, yeah, and- I was thinking right. I might do something where I like disappear 20 minutes through and then you guys go. <laughs> I guess well, I was in it. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Bear Nick and ABCs. We're going to start off with that as our beginner this week because I mean, I can't, I can't resist a good <laughs> pun and you're not going to get one better than that. That was just perfect setup timing there on that one. Um, this week we are discussing the song Vanishing with my friends Aaron and Betsy. Hey. Hey. And returning friend Tyler. Great to Ooh. see you all. I, I've, I've like a new different sound. I don't know. <laughs> Welcome Thanks. back, Tyler. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah, don't disappear you. halfway through the show. We don't want that. <laughs> I think you're looking for the word vanish, not disappear, <laughs> but okay. What? You think you're a magician now? Because you know what? This song originally was called The Magician. Wishing you had the power to make you reappear. He's a magician. Hoping, wishing, and you're the one vanishing. They should have put it on snack time. That would have been more appropriate. Ah. Well, I mean, that's a good question for Aaron, though. What album is this on? Well, it's obviously a Kevin song. Uh, it has that <laughs> ponderous, curious quality that I often hear in his songs. I'm just, I mean, I'm going to say all in good time. No. Nope. 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 Go back. The hint Go back is if I'm albums. here, it's not all in good time. Baird- ah, okay. <laughs> not a fan. Okay. Good to know. Um, did he have songs on Bear Lake? And- Bare naked ladies are me. Yeah, bare naked ladies are me. That is another release of theirs. <laughs> that is the that's the video compilation mm-hmm. CD. I mean DVD. Yeah. Okay. Oh, they actually. Yeah, bare naked. <laughs> they ladies. have a spoonerism on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking the lady, lady in the, the lake. Water. Uh, no. Um, yeah. So bare naked ladies are yes. me or men. It, it's on me. It's on. Okay, I at that point I I thought it was like, I, I guess probably that yeah he probably had a, a few songs on on those albums, but I, I it's so dominated by Paige Robertson because that was like that was their you know Beatles and Strife era where they're like well just everything <laughs> is a Paige Robertson song. <laughs> well, except for when Paige, except for when Kevin and Jim threw some in, or and George Harrison, they often mm. gave credit to Paige Robertson. <laughs> Okay, so I was I was in the right yeah, era. Yeah, you're only off not by that a couple albums. <clears throat> so um, they they don't play this one live. Um, it's only ever been played eight times live. One of which was at the Glen Gould Theater that they used it to record the Army tracks for the live version of the CD. <laughs> Did they play it in Vegas? <laughs> nope. That's Did a they, shame. I don't think ever played Damn. Vegas. Okay, <laughs> boys, we know That's you listen. Next time you're in Vegas, play. Did they play, play it, it like on, a, it on an iceberg that was slowly sinking into the sea? <laughs> 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 oh, that's just sad. We oh, poor polar bear floating alone on the little ice. <laughs> <Yeah>. No. 
No, seriously, <laughs> give us some help. We're vanished. Or it should be the la- it should be the last song they play at their last concert. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, tinge of oh. sadness taints the evening. Wow. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of, of notes for this one, so um, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Aaron, pretty quickly and pretty early to to have you do a breakdown. <laughs> All right, let's break <laughs> it down. So, Vanishing was recorded at approximately 79 beats per minute, and it is in the key of C-sharp minor, uh, which is not a key (laughs) that I would choose if I were a uh, keyboard player writing a song. But (laughs) since Kevin is a real (laughs) pianist, and I am just an aspiring one, I imagine he has no problem with it. Um, The verse seems to go from C sharp minor to A major back and forth until the transition towards the chorus where we move up to B major, which acts as what we call the five of. This would be the five of three. So because going from the fifth degree of. Yes, five of three. uh, Yeah, (laughs) seven lines cousin. A very musical, uh, very musical. It's like a. (laughs) Now I want to start like a Borg themed <laughs> acapella group. Oh wow! Like a barber shop. I am a Borg. I am vibraphone of Borg. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it resolves as if it were the five resolving to the one. It resolves uh, to the uh, E major, which is where we start the chorus. So that's C, C sharp minor to A major, C sharp minor to A major to B major, or more precisely, B dominant which in terms of degree is one, six, one, six, seven. The chorus on that E major to A major, E major to A major, then E major to B major, uh, to A major to C sharp minor. So it resolves back to the tonic to get into the verse changes. And that would be three, six, three, six, three, seven, six, one. And the bridge where he says you are vanishing is B minor to C sharp minor to A major. This is repeated four times, and then we immediately go back to E major for the chorus. It's pretty simple. Uh, the structure is verse one, which is your A changes, your chorus B, verse two A, chorus B, verse three A, chorus B, bridge C, chorus B, bridge again. And you actually end on the bridge, which is interesting. C. So that would be A, B, A, B. A, B, C, B, C, so ab, ab, bab, kabab, which sounds <laughs> a little like a magician stuttering while trying to say abracadabra. <laughs> so I wonder if that was intentional. Uh, no, but ending on that A major rather than resolving to the tonic C sharp means the song ends with a little unresolved tension, you may have noticed. It leaves you kind of leaning in, wanting more like you've just seen a magician vanish and are waiting for them to reappear, but they never do. Uh, I'll also note, in terms of length of each of the three verses, they actually get longer each time. The first verse oh. is two lines of lyrics lasting four measures. Uh, the second verse is three lines of lyrics lasting six measures. And the third verse is four lines of lyrics lasting eight measures. Now, it's not unusual for, say, like the first verse of a song to be half the length of the others. So if it were like four bars and then verse two or eight bars and verse three were eight bars, I wouldn't really have mentioned it. Um, But that's really interesting where it's like going from, you know, uh, four to six to eight. So I don't know if that's supposed to be programmatic, but given it's a song about a magician, I can't help but wonder if that constantly shifting is like supposed to indicate things changing like part of a magician's show. Well, as someone who is just like singing along to the song in the car, it definitely was like you always feel like the chorus is about to start and you go. He's a magician. And you're like singing along, waiting for the chorus. But then it's like, oh, no, there's another line of the verse. So it is kind of a bait and switch every yeah, time. Well, so I think it's it totally reminds me of like mixed on. direction. Like magicians say, use a large action to cover a small action. They'll distract you over here and do something over there. So that could very well be programmatic. No, that was a great. Wait, that's how they do that? <laughs> a magician never tells. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great point, Aaron, about the, the lengthening of the of mm. the verses. I, I did not notice that. And I was I was literally just teaching a poetry uh, lesson to my students earlier this morning about the length of stanzas. Interesting. No, so that's, that's cool. on me. 
<laughs> well, you can bring this in to, on the next day to them and be like, as I was talking about in the last class. This one might be a little too abstract for them. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Might be too abstract for us. We're going to get into the lyrics yeah. later. We are, but in terms of the music, there's nothing really like spectacular and amazing with what instruments they're using. Um, Jim's on the double bass. Tyler's on drum and percussion. Kevin is on acoustic guitar. Steven's on electric guitar. And Ed is on electric guitar. Now, as you mentioned, Aaron, like a, mm. a pianist, a keyboardist would never want to probably write a song in C sharp. So he's playing minor. guitar on this. Yeah. Well, he didn't. He, he was playing the well, guitar. I, I'm, on I'm, this. I'm, I'm like half joking <laughs> when I say no stuff organ. like that. It's just, it's the way that I learned, you know. Um, it makes I, it I, harder. Like the sharp for the last thing I learned. Like I learned, obviously, you start with C because it's no accidentals. And then for me, I learned all the flats first and then I learned the sharp. So the more sharps you add, the further it was in my my self kind of taught education that I was learning them so that I still fe don't feel as comfortable with them. If you look at most of the songs I've written, it's like either like A minor I love because, you know, it's, it's minor plus it's no accidentals. Uh, you know, something like C minor has only got a few accidentals, B flat, E flat, stuff like that. It's pretty straightforward. So, But anyway, that's just a, a little personal idiosyncrasy. But yeah, I imagine that even for someone who uh, plays a lot, it's nice to not have to worry so much about that if you're uh, playing guitar instead say an interesting little thing that has happened it has nothing mm. to do if we were doing this album by album this would not show up but last week's song upside down was also yeah, in so. c sharp my wow name. i love that song so it's very interesting that 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 just happened oh well, i was thinking because i was listening to this song and we were doing it if we were doing it in album order the next song would be rule the world with love which on this podcast is oh, yes. a beloved yeah favorite. i love that song too <laughs> <laughs> i do love that song we'll have to talk about how much i love this yes. song later. <laughs> um let's talk is anyone i have one more note musically but does anyone else have anything musically that they want to mention well, I wanted to expand on what you said. Um, it is, it's a very simple song and there's nothing wrong with that. And I said it was very much a Kevin song. It's not just because he's singing it right away feels like hey, if there's a song that you're listening to by the bare naked ladies or it's just bare naked ladies. We, is it, is it because it's like Eagles doesn't have the, the, right. It's just bare yeah. naked ladies. How dare you? The bare naked ladies. <laughs> let me just, let me just go use the Google yeah. and search Smoky that. Um, but no, um, if you hear a song by Bare Naked Ladies <laughs> and it sounds like you should be hearing like crickets chirping and outdoor noises, it's probably a Kevin song. Um, <laughs> and it's just it's got that real like very chill country ballad kind of feel to it. But what's interesting is Kevin's voice is not particularly country. So it, it always makes a really interesting kind of uh, contrast, I feel, uh, when you hear that. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's a nice song. It's a pretty song. It's uh, it's very chill. Uh, and then the lyrics are interesting, I think. Well, before we get to the mm. lyrics, I have one more thing musically. Tyler, please. Up, but it looks like Tyler has something. He yes, wants I, to bring. I, I put my finger up in the Zoom <laughs> to indicate that I wanted to talk now. Um, um, one, I think I think Tyler Stewart, not me. Uh, I think Tyler Stewart mm. gets, has some good drumming in this song. Um, the sort of like um, play with the toms that you like is not a traditional like rock and roll beat, obviously kind of get some good rhythms there. And then I wanted to ask you guys, how would you describe the sort of like weeping guitar timbre that we get in this song? <laughs> um, and does that sort of match what Aaron was just saying about Kevin's unique voice? Like, does that, do those two go hand in hand? Yeah, almost? I think so. It's got, it's a kind of a mellow sound. It's, um, I, I actually be very curious to know, you said there were three guitars on this Tracy. I was, I'd be curious to know if one of them was like a dobro or something. Cause it sounds a little twangier, but it doesn't sound like a banjo. So I'm wondering if there's something in between. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, it could be. It's just um, not mentioned specifically. But Is a Dobro like what um, Mario fights in the Dobro world? If that's... Yeah, you jump on the Dobro's head. <laughs> <laughs> Dobro sounds. It's Dobro's. the next generation of the Pillsbury Doughboy. I feel right? like it should be like a pizza place called the Dobros or something mm-hmm. like that. Where <laughs> all the fraternity brothers congregate. So if Dobro is a comp, <laughs> if Dobro is a company, if it's a brand, then it's not the qual- it is not the product that was used on this album they have used it on other uh, it's albums a, it's actually not a, this one a, it's it's an instrument not a company uh, a cool I don't, um it, it looks very much like a okay well then they don't hmm. mention it because they've mentioned it in other it is definitely other, used um, in like country music which is other, why i thought it might have been um, but liners um i think usually it's probably used with a slide but not always so um anyways that just curious but yeah i mean it, it yeah, to to Tyler's point, I mean this this song sits in a weird like area. If you had like a like one of those quadrant maps where countries in one place and rocks in another, and like maybe pop or ballads yeah, or like something. A Venn diagram. It's yeah, it's 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 in the middle of a bunch of uh, kind of different genres and feels. Um, That's. That's literally the other thing I was going to mm. ask you guys is like, where is, where is Kevin Hearn's like <laughs> sound in the spectrum of, I mean, rock and roll or music <laughs> in general? Like, um, I, I recently became sort of hyper fixated mm. on the song Desperado by mm. Eagles nice. and he doesn't seem too far off. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that. It depends. Like, there's some songs where he's very um, electric um, and, and very techno. There's other songs where he is much okay. more country esque. Some songs you're, he's very folksy. You're absolutely and then right. Some as songs far he as blends like, all of the above. And instrumentation. But I would say, because when he said techno, I was like, really? And then I thought, well, Heartbeeps. Or no, Heartbeeps was, sorry, <laughs> Passcode. Heartbeeps was passcode? that movie that we talked about. Passcode, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, well in yeah. the Cousins but, but album. I would say Passcode <laughs> also is sort of a ballad. I think that he's a balladeer, I would say. And there are, there are different, like, um, you know, genres or subgenres you could go into. But I think most of his music tends to be very heartfelt and kind of fall into that kind of ballad range, even though, you know, again, they could be quite different uh, from an instrumentation kind of standpoint. Yeah. So Tyler, I want to, I want to answer the question that you posed Mm. the second one um, about the guitar. Um, My notes on the guitar were harsh, highly distorted. In this song. And I don't, yes. The. And mm. I don't. Yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's sort of a background drone of that, I guess, a little bit. It, it keeps coming up throughout. Like it, when it first opens, and it's like ed or or tyler or so, i mean tyler uh kevin someone just kept like strumming mm. it and then just like lets it go and go but it's extremely distorted and and so you, yeah you, ha- harsh is the only word that i could think of because it, it to me it it does not go well with tyler's voice it kind of grates against it um and You're to me it was the, very the grating gentle the strum song. Yeah, in the background, I was. I thought you were talking about like the picking, uh, the more melodic line. No, yeah, no, no. I, I hear. It. Yeah, I know what you're saying. You um, I wouldn't call it harsh. It is distorted, but I don't think it's overly distorted. You hear this a lot in like country ballads and stuff like that. I think it's fairly genre appropriate. Um, I, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I, we're talking about yeah, the song yeah. vanishing, I would say it's right? Abrupt. I think it's <laughs> and I, I think it's kind of like like echoey that, that, and lonely a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I think the the idea that like no one else is really writing songs yeah. like past very code, true. very true, big backyard, oh, bag, bag of, of bones. bones. Yeah. <laughs> like nobody else is doing that. So Kevin, you have to respect that. Like he has such a specific sphere. And what's nice about bare naked ladies is that they all kind of have their own specific sphere. And they combine mm. it so well. Very true. Most of the time, I would agree. <laughs> Um, now there is an acoustic version of this without that harsh electric guitar Um, I'm going to share that with you because Aaron was not able to hear that this week because I was trying to keep from him what album this was on Um, and of course it closed itself out so it's going to take me an extra moment to load it the other other wild Kevin song while we're waiting is don't Mm. shuffle me back (laughs) We've, we've covered yes, that well. song. Pick up a shoe. Pretend it's a telephone in that I'm talking to you. I, we did bag when you mentioned bag of bones. I that was early on in the podcast. Obviously, it was bees, and I was not nearly well as steeped in kind of like <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to like I wouldn't like hear where I was instantly <laughs> like okay this is a Kevin song. It's kind of surprised me thinking back on it because I was like oh wow yeah that's a very different kind of song but it makes sense you know. <laughs> yeah big that is dogs definitely kevin <laughs> barking dogs <laughs> only he would bring something like this to the band so they should do that and big backyard combined <laughs> so it's like the clifford set <laughs> <laughs> i want to hear yeah. that live not big backyard Bag of Bones would be fun. Uh, yeah, I think i think it's interesting that they're going for big backyard as like mm-hmm. a sort of crowd pleasing um, got a walk type vibe, but it's, I mean, it's not hitting that same zone, obviously. Okay. Hold on one second. My computer. I like that they put mm. Township of King back in the set list. At, at the end of this, I would like to talk about the concert, but. Um... <laughs> in, in the, in the yes. zero minutes we'll have when we're done recording the episode and get to talk. Oh, I, in the we're logging back Zoom. on if this thing Although kicks it's... us off. Um, all right. Okay. It's it's interesting though because early like early in film history there were like certain filmmakers who were using the restriction of like right. okay this film reel is only going to have like thirty five minutes of space on it so we're going to shoot a nature documentary with thirty five minutes or of like, stuff. Sorry, go ahead. And 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 so much of yeah. art has sort of lost that like physical no, yeah like limitation because helping sort you of, be creative and things like that. Agreed. Um, especially those very literal like space limitations which we just um, don't have anymore who was peter jackson when he first started making movies had a hand cranked camera that only could like hold like 13 or 14 seconds worth of film so that would be the longest possible shot he could have but ironically now when we have <laughs> unlimited potential shots uh everything he, is like made, you know half a second cuts so i don't know <laughs> now, and- and he makes the movies right. that are three hours long. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. So this is the. But interestingly, in, in King mm-hmm. Kong, this is the acoustic the version. Rabbit and the acoustic guitar had a handkerchief and red with the wave of a wand. He'll pull your heart strings. He's a magician, hoping, wishing, and you're the one vanishing. Yeah, I kind of prefer that version. Honestly, that if I were to listen the to the two different versions, that's the one that I would listen to. I mean, a studio version of that mm, sort of yeah, instrumentation, definitely. I would say. Um, but it's interesting because when they go to play it live, the the few times they have played it live, Ed goes back to the electric guitar. He he definitely likes to use that electric guitar. <laughs> that's interesting, though. It's a rare song where Kevin yeah, would play acoustic and Ed would play electric. <laughs> thank you Betsy, for showing my point that's that noise <laughs> i 
I okay. So I guess for me, I still don't think it's it's as um, off putting as you seem to find it, Tracy. Like um, you say, harsh. I mean, I listen to to death metal at times, so like for me, that's not a harsh <laughs> guitar at all. But I I see what you mean. Like, I think within, what makes within it the harsh of the song, you weren't right. expecting and it clashes to you. Right. I mean, everything else in the song is gentle, and every, and and. Kevin has that kind of gentle voice, that almost mm. folksy type voice. To hear that harsh guitar, then in contrast with all the other instruments that are playing softly, just did not work for me. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the um, ambient music song "Aquatic" by Daniel Lanois, um, which has sort of like an ambient music music song that like has sort of a harsh guitar but it is played for very mellow mm-hmm. obviously because it's ambient music um so yes. it, it's a juxtaposition yes. <laughs> one would call it and sometimes i can enjoy it but for whatever reason on this song i just did not like it trouble with tracy. That, trouble that is with the trouble tracy. with tracy it grinds my gears <laughs> it grinds your um, gears <laughs> and uh <laughs> we talk about the lyrics sure we should definitely get over to the lyrics <laughs> Um, I, my, my notes are, I have Kevin likes to write these lyrics that are very reminiscent to me of REM where he's painting a picture with Mm. very few (laughs) words. Sometimes he paints it very, um, very much in detail. And sometimes it's more like a Jackson Pollock. Um, I would say this one has, (laughs) has like more detail it's more of like a shiny happy people so you get the picture yeah i mean it's paint. it's a pretty prosaic story it tells it it tells a pretty yeah. straightforward tale um but that's the type of lyrics that i like that's to, that's how i see him writing his music like he likes to put these little splats in there maybe this is just my like prejudice seeping in and i am i am prejudiced uh, uh, against magician a magician killed my parents because <laughs> those goddamn vanishing <laughs> bastards um they never came back they well, made my mom disappear sorry, sorry well one i one i had mm. not thought about what the song meant until today when i looked at the lyrics so that's part of it so when i was first looking at it i was like okay so is the magician like he'll pull your heartstrings is that I, I interpreted it as having like a negative connotation as in like the magician was sort of like a, a toxic man, like leading a, a lady pres- uh, to be heteronormative on a, on a one night stand and then letting her vanish because he didn't want to continue on with the relationship. But it mm. actually seems like it's the opposite. It's a, a, a lover, <laughs> man, woman, or somewhere in between who disappears from a relationship despite the work that the magician is putting into it. And magicians can also be any gender, although it is a male dominant. Yeah, I mean, he does say he in the in the lyrics. Yeah. So um Okay, thank you. I would say that both of those are in some aspects correct in the way that I view the song. In that I thought, yeah, here's a womanizing magician who um yes, I know, 10 minutes got it. Um a womanizing magician who finally kind of oh you found a necklace behind your ear someone and she just disappears and runs off and yeah yeah we'll we'll meet up sometime and then like leaves and and he's kind of like hey that that really sucks (laughs) (laughs) yeah i'm not sure how um i guess you could interpret it like literally or you could interpret it as uh, a little bit more metaphorically like um, you know, it could be a magician as in like he's, uh, you know, able to maybe you yeah, to take kind of like pick up what what Tyler was uh, starting there as a thread. Like maybe it's someone who is able to read people very well or tell them what they want to hear. And, you know, he's like a magician in the sense that he can control people's feelings or pull their heartstrings. But then maybe this one person actually really got to him and really he really cared about them. And then they vanished or. I kind of like this idea that it's like he he's a magician calls some woman up from the audience just is like oh my goodness I I'm really uh, I love this person they're they're beautiful I'd love to get to know them better maybe they you know maybe they hang out after the show for a bit and then she flies home and he never sees her again and like in his head he's constructed this potential 
future with this person, but it's never going to happen. And she's vanished. So like, to me, I think that's kind of interesting. It's like an unrequited love song, but it's like, or, or like the morning of a loss of a relationship, but it's like a potential relationship or like a future relationship that never was instead of an actual relationship that, that occurred. The other thing going on here is that it's told in the third person perspective for the magician. Yeah. But then he's it's a you're the one vanishing. So it's almost like you're a, vanishing. Yeah. So it's like, so maybe it's like he's a, speaking. It's almost to like a, she loves you. Yeah. 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 Except the opposite. Like, yeah, he loves she you. She doesn't love you. Yeah, he loves you, but you disappeared. Um, it's like his friend. Like he comes, she comes back and is talking to her friend, and her friend says, "Oh, so let me tell this story." Let me tell you how the man interpreted this because you, you had your own perspective on it, and just <laughs> j- just understand that man is heartbroken. You do you, honey, but that man. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't owe him anything, but just so you know, he is a mess. That man is whispering in a lion's ear about yeah. you right now. Yeah, he's not well. <laughs> um, well, I, he may I not do, have an ear left at this point. I, I do, I do like the subject of like the idea of vanishing, like, like somebody, uh, you know, who you maybe, you know, depending on whether this actually occurred or not, but like whatever, if you have feelings for someone and then you're no longer with them they do start to kind of fade in your memory. And there is something very sad about that. Um, there's another song that this reminds me of. I had to do my my alternative band uh, shout out uh, to the Guggenheim Grotto, who wrote a song called Never Before, which contains the lyrics. And if I could recall just one of her eyes, I could clone for the other side. But of all the cells in my head, the first ones to die were the ones that held her inside. And that reminds me very much of like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And there's something about this song as well. Although, again, the entire relationship could have merely merely been like potential. Uh, But I kind of like there's there's something that appeals to the uh, the hopeless romantic in me and the uh, and the. uh, So it's it's not never before from the Muppet movie. However, however, <laughs> when Miss no, Piggy disappears different. from the restaurant and Kermit sings, I hope that something better comes along. That actually does kind of feel akin to this song. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> what do you think, Betsy? I think I'm kind of in between what you guys are thinking. I'm mm. probably closer to you, Aaron, like piggybacking off of what you said. I kind of my first impression was that this is a guy that's not super confident in himself, but he has one quality that he's somewhat confident about. And so he's kind of overcompensating to like win over whatever love interest he has. And he's like throwing out, you know, all of his tricks and everything and trying to lure her in. And, and it almost seems like she sees past it. Um, and then this I thought of a um, song for huh? Job from Arrested and Development. No, actually, I thought of um, <laughs> from the Big Bang Theory, Howard Wallowitz, because <laughs> he actually does tricks and music, uh, musician, magician, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. things. And one of uh, somebody asked him once, like, "Why do you try too hard?" And he's like, "What chance do I have if I don't try too hard?" <laughs> So to me, that seems like the character. And then, mm-hmm. and then like, it's, it's like, he's so uh, geared up and overcompensating that it's yeah, off-putting and uh, it just kind of shuts people down. Just the way that Tracy found that guitar to be off-putting. So maybe that was I know. Well. And all I can think of is uh, between two friends with that, with uh, Zach Galifianakis and uh, Jennifer <laughs> Lawrence. And she's like, you need to be off-putting because it was a bad joke. Anyway, not related to anything. But that's fine. I think the simple poetry of the chorus, he's a magician hoping, wishing, and you're the one vanishing, like that triplet is 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 poetry, like mm-hmm. right there. Yeah, it's like, a great. You don't need the rest of the great, song. A uh, few lines there, definitely. I feel like... I think we got to do some yeah. rankings. Okay, I have one more question about the lyrics and then... I know sometimes I'll just I'll just do my guest thing and let sit back and let Tracy transition us to to ratings. Oh. But we're not in a rush anymore because peek behind the curtains we switch zooms. But anyway, <laughs> my, my last question is this, and it's wild because I I tried to do a natural transition, but then I mentioned the zoom thing, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, did you guys 
look up is is it common knowledge what a lion's ear is no. i assumed he meant the ear of a lion <laughs> is this like an i was thinking is this like an elephant ear is it a pastry i mean he he <sighs> did mention the bellagio and that i think he was making a pun about well, a, a we're, we're sort of at the, uh... statement about Siegfried and Roy, although Siegfried and Roy used white tigers, um, mm. and they were at the Mirage. Okay. Um, so a really Magicians bad way do to... use animals in their act sometimes. Very rarely. It's Tracy, usually like just Google circus tamers. Lion's ear? Do you want to just Google lion's ear? Is this an urban dictionary? No, I want to hear it from you. We're yeah, just banter. Tyler. <laughs> It's 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 just a type of flower. It's just a, a a nickname for a type of flower. So he's whispering into a flower, which I get like maybe it's the type of flower that like a magician like mm. prop is supposed to look like. Although I don't maybe. think so. But I think you're right. It's the pun between mm. like a flower and like a literal lion's ear that like a stage act like would have something like and here i am like playing with the the lion's body and showing how how tame it is and how much control i have over it and nothing's bad ever happens its to me. <laughs> I really i really like that blonde that was in the front row <laughs> oh god well if you put it like it that makes it's it a creepy. lot creepier yeah, yeah. <laughs> chills man they're multiple well i mean read the lyric <laughs> <laughs> the lyric is a little creepy he says, all, all the words of love he longs for you to hear. He whispers them each night into the lion's ear. Creepy. I, so instead, what he's saying I, to the lion is, you are the most beautiful thing in the world. And I really, I really wish that you would be with me for the rest of my life. Does that make I it mean, better? That, that's the, <laughs> that's, there's, the, there's the line between creepy and yeah. flattering. I think it was the voice that, that Tracy all... did that made it super creepy <laughs> the first time. <laughs> well, I mean, I've heard that like in for years <laughs> that that like me whispering sweet nothings is really creepy. I, I did everything um, right and she vanished on me. <laughs> yeah, much better. <laughs> Dating the podcast. Oh, that and was a really good imitation. Do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did ghosting as a Ooh. phrase even exist at this point in like 2007? Mm. I think it was just starting to catch on. I think, yeah. It's 2006. Ooh, that might be... Kevin was the one who first came up with the idea of ghosting. ghosting. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, we know you listen. Come on the show. Talk to us about how you invented ghosting. <laughs> you are an insanely mean person who decided to create this thing. <laughs> Tracy does not speak for the rest of us, but uh, if you want to dispute or disprove <laughs> his claims, you must, of course, come on the too. show to do so. So please come on. <laughs> um, one, one source is saying that to Get Ghost <laughs> um, gained popularity in 1990s hip hop. Oh wow! Okay. Um, but that's like, but uh, but but Wikipedia is saying that ghosting, simmering, and icing are colloquial simmering. terms um, that originated in the early 2000s. I, I'm going to go back further. I'm going to say that Ray Stance got the ghost way back in uh, 1984. Uh, he sure did. <laughs> yeah, there was that very, very uh, not not kid friendly scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, simmering. I'm get, based on <laughs> based on context. I'm guessing simmering is like keeping multiple people like Online. just sending the messages. Yeah, kind of stringing them <laughs> along. I think I think the idea of um, using the metaphor comparison of a ghost to refer to like a, a lover mm. who disappears goes back to the 50s but the sort of um linguistic transition of ghost turning into a verb to ghosting. like a verb yeah. an intransitive verb Ooh. um or, or or a transitive verb she ghosted me um uh does have the origins in the 2000s specifically with the rise there of was a lot media. of that going on a lot of uh verbification in the 2000s yes <laughs> I mean, it's it's actually a constant linguistic thing, but yes, we we we've done a, an especially good re, yeah. good job of it in yeah. recent years. Hmm. 
All right. On that note, <laughs> I'm trying to think like maybe that should be our term that we're going to re- measure on. But it's a it's a verb. So we can't really measure on how much how, ghosting. How, how many people have ghosted you? No. Um, <laughs> how many ghosts have you busted? Uh, have you been on the hinge? Uh, I was thinking lion's ears. Yeah, I was thinking lion's ears, too, actually. How many lion's ears? With lion's ears? I was thinking the uh, lion's ears. <laughs> How many water? There can fountains? only ever be one Bellagio. Mm. <laughs> but those are Tony Benedict's casinos. <laughs> <laughs> and supposedly they're tearing down the big old fountains out front. So what are they going to do now? Wow, that was a staple. Uh, drink the water, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> they might need to. <laughs> don't, drink. <laughs> <laughs> don't drink the water. No. Um, so yeah, how many magicians do you give this song, Aaron? <laughs> how many Sigmunds and Roy's? <laughs> how many dead Roy? No. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> how many pens and tellers? I give, it, I give it one pen, one teller, a Jay Sankey, a David Copperfield. I give it four magicians out of five. I think it just barely and half yeah. a Houdini. <laughs> right. Saw it in half. That's what I should. I should have gone for the half. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it just. It's interesting because I, I. I was thinking about rating it like a three point nine because I do like it quite a bit, but I wasn't sure if it was going to go on my playlist. But hearing that live version, I want to go and listen to that again. I think it just makes my list. So. It's on notice. We'll see come New Year's if I downgrade it, but I believe it will be. It will end up on my best of playlist because I do like it quite a bit. It's a nice, sweetly sad song. It's a good. It's a good Kevin song. If somebody wanted me to like, if I wanted to point to this and be like, this is what a Kevin song sounds like, even though he's got a pretty vast uh, breadth of field. Yeah, robust oeuvre, oeuvre. And, indeed. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so I like it a lot. I think for for magicians. Okay. What about you, Bitsy? Um, well, actually, um, I did have one quote I wanted to share before I mm. put a score out. Um, and it made me wonder about like where this guy was coming from that he felt like he needed to be this performer to kind of win people over. And I came across a, a Franz Kafka quote of, it says, I was ashamed of myself and I realized life was a costume party and I intended with my real face. So I don't know if that's like how it started and then he mm. felt like he like needed to build on himself to be like appealing enough to people to like win him over. But anyway, I thought that was interesting. And I would give it 4.2 magicians or lion's ears or Bellagio's or nice. whatever. <laughs> Tyler, how about you? How how many how many uh magicians or lions ears or Bellagios would you <laughs> give the song? We're just gonna keep adding on top of this. Bellagio's ears. How many well, Bellagio's ears? <laughs> to, to to respond to Betsy, um friend of friend of Stephen Page, Craig Northy of odds, <laughs> not uh, the yeah. odds. Would 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 say would say it was the suit that yes. got me the gig. That's right. Yes. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a picture that I'm holding of someone who's cool, and that's almost what a magician does: is they present a version of, of themselves that's yeah. cooler than they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think I tend to insert interpret this song as like a much simpler metaphor of just like there's no literal magician it's just someone who's pining Mm -hmm. and someone else who's vanishing when they want them to reappear like usually the thing i do is make people up here like and and now they're now they're gone and my my life feels Mm. incomplete um to respond to what aaron said it feels more more like the quintessential kevin song in the sense that it's not like it's not so good and it's not so bad it's just exactly what a kevin song is there's no and i i wouldn't put it necessarily it's i wouldn't put it up among my favorite kevin songs but i also wouldn't s- skip it like i would bag of bones so you don't like big barking biting dogs <laughs> it's an interesting novelty <laughs> song but um not really um and <laughs> For some reason, I asked to come on this episode and talk <laughs> about this song. You're so like, I, I have like to it. defend Kevin. 
So let's hear your I, defense. Well, it's weird because I do have this affinity for like songs off of Our Me mm. and I and songs off of Silverball, obviously. <laughs> um so so it's like something about that album, just like I listened to it over and over again for some amount of time. And so this song is just mm. ingrained in my head as like something that I could listen to on repeat forever. Even then, I'm still, you know, um, 3.75 forks. Oops, that's the Doughboys or the Dough Bros. Um, 3.75 mu- musicians. No, that's ears. <laughs> 3.75 Lions <laughs> Magicians. Okay. Yep. And if someone got type... sawed into a quarter and, and three fourths instead of half, they messed up there. <laughs> it's a lot of blood. That seems like a ten, Penn and Teller joke. Like, we, other magicians saw people. <laughs> we just half. cut we, our heads we saw, off. <laughs> just their, their head. <laughs> could definitely see them doing that. Penn and Teller, we know you listen. Come on the show. Yeah. <laughs> Teller especially. Mm. Yeah. See, I'd nice love to, get him talking. to see uh-huh. a Siegfried and Roy show. I'd love to see a Penn and Teller show. But this song to me is neither of those things. Um, this song to me Ooh, is, trouble is, Tracy. is a Las Vegas magician. <laughs> and anyone who's gone to see a Las Vegas magician who hasn't really made a name for himself. And I'm not talking about uh, Piff. The, or her the dragon. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not talking about someone that that is really gonna. I'm talking about like it, you watch it and you're not really impressed at all. Um, that that's to me like you walk out and you're like, I don't even remember what that guy's name is, but I'm not going back to that hotel because I just really did not enjoy oh, no, that. I could see ev- the, the great Aaron Dini is using his <laughs> magical powers to predict Wait. that Tracy Wait. is drinking the haterade on this episode. Oh, Tracy is... Yeah. I was sitting in the magic theater watching this, drinking so much haterade that I walked out <laughs> hating the show wow. and burned down the hotel oh. that it was in. Oh. Um, no. I, I absolutely Absolutely hate this song. Oh, um, no. Yeah, you, the, you will rarely hear those words come out of my mouth about BNL song, but I really, there's nothing I like about this song. Um, the acoustic, you like Bag of Bones more yeah. than this song. Yeah, I found <laughs> endearing parts to Bag of Bones when I remove, like the music is usually the first thing that draws me into a song. And this one like makes me want to skip it immediately. And then I would jump to the middle of the song. I'm like, okay, well, it's just that beginning. Let me give it a fresh take. Nope. I hated it right in the middle. Um, and like in order for the lyrics to grab me, like REM or something like that, like I've got to like the music that's behind it first. And then I want to like look into it more and say, okay, tell me more about this. What what are you trying to say with this song? I don't even want to get that far. Now, is the poem that that Kevin is writing here good? Yes. I mean, it's not amazing, but it's Shell Still Silverstein. It it's good. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to even get that far. I don't want to even look that far because the music is so abrasive to me at that point, especially that guitar. So I took that out. I listened to the acoustic version and (laughs) I listened to the acoustic version and I was like, it, this makes me feel nothing (laughs) at all. (laughs) Like, wow. Jerome makes me feel something. (laughs) This song doesn't make me feel anything when I'm listening to it. Unless I have that harsh guitar. And if I have the harsh guitar, I hate it. I'm sorry. I have to, like, I have to give this a 1.25. Wow. This yeah. is, if I if they came and they played this, look, which luckily they don't play this live. If they played this live, you would see me vanish. You would go get a beer? I would go over to the <laughs> in session scene. <laughs> and if they were still playing it when I got back, there'd be a war. That There would be a, definitely be a war on it. <laughs> on point. a particular topic or... Well, I mean, most of the time it's a war on drugs, but right, it'd be a war on this song. <laughs> they haven't played that song in a while. So tell us how you really feel, Tracy. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> yeah, where do you stand? <laughs> All right. I'm going to give this a 1.25. 
Yeah, uh, but thank you for joining us, Tyler. Where can you send people yeah. to to see more of your stuff? Um, well, most people don't see my stuff, but they do, similar to a podcast, listen to it. Um, the Wildcat Minute podcast has been reviewing high school musical movies one minute at a time for, just say, the past three years. And um, season three of Wildcat Minute, covering high school musical three colon senior year, has started. We're about 15, 16 minutes in by the time this episode releases. Um, it's a good season. We've had a lot of laughs so far. Um, if you want to go back to season one, season two of us talking about High School Musical, that would be great too. Um, Wildcat Minute is the name of the show, but the name of the podcast feed is Amateur Nerds. Um, that is sort of our brand. My sister and I, who record the podcast together, we talk about it. She's seen the movies. I haven't seen the movies. That's part of the fun of the show too, is I'm sort of guessing what's going on every minute in. And, you know, we have a sort of contention between us where she t tends to be positive and I tend to be a little bit negative. And um, unlike, a, unlike a show like this, where everyone generally agrees that they like bare naked ladies, except some episodes where Tracy drinks the haterade. <laughs> <laughs> we have the built in tension on our show. It's 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 brother and sister fighting. It's not it's not it's, it's mostly just funny. Yeah, no, thank you guys very much. And hopefully, for, Betsy, you don't unfriend me for my school. Nice tonight. knowing you, Tracy. We can't get past this. We are well, at an impasse. <laughs> there will be a war on this podcast, or there will be a war on drugs. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some trouble with Tracy, for sure. There won't be a war on drugs, because Betsy's not coming back next week. <laughs> no. Burning down this place. Well, I can't because it's still metaphorically <laughs> burning down the house. All right. I mean, you're kind of in your own house right now, so that would really work so well. Yeah, take that bit out then for the insurance reasons. Well, I, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I promise that none of you will vanish from my head or from my heart. So have a good night. Aww. And I will see so you next long. time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> see ya. Thanks, that was fun. Don't forget, no regrets. Except maybe one. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wilde. Plus, our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.